the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. Hey guys, Peter Franson here from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. Well, what I normally say is that right now I'm going to attempt to examine the Bible and dissect some of the churchy language we can really easily take for granted, uh, looking into uh, languages and history as I'm able to try and get at the heart of the text so that we can hopefully see and apply some of what God has for you and me in these words today. I'm going to be doing something very, very similar today. It's just going to be a lot more off the cuff, um, and I... Uh, I mean, largely because this last week I took off to really have some focused time working on long-term creative projects, which I don't normally give myself time for in my uh, in my work rhythms in recent years. So I'm going to try. I'm trying to get back into that. So, but I wanted to have something here that would be worthwhile um, in this section of the podcast and put up a video uh, for that that gets us into the Bible uh, this week as well. And this last weekend, I had a special getaway weekend with my boys, something we try to do about once a year, maybe more if we're able. Uh, I detest camping, and so instead of camping, we went to a hotel room, and we brought some TVs and consoles, and we just uh, had a bunch of fun with video games. And then on Sunday morning, I uh, just presented a, a little devotional to them, and um, which, as I was looking at it, I was like, you know... Yes, this is very personal to where they're at right now in junior high and high school, but I realized, man, um, this is so relevant to geeks. It's so relevant to my wiring, to to theirs as well as I can detect in, in the ways that they uh, kind of are, are similar to me. And it's so relevant to, to so many geeks, um, a lot of whom discover kind of like their geek interests and stuff during junior high and high school, and maybe during those times figure out, oh... I'm kind of like other people think I'm kind of weird or a little different or something like that, you know. Um, so anyway, let me uh, let me share these verses from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 in the ESV and just make some kind of mostly off-the-cuff comments. I, I made a few notes to share with my boys that I'll share with you guys. But 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Uh, this letter was written during a time where the recipients were experiencing doubt. They'd been under some false teaching, and so there was some confusion about some things that uh, that the writer wanted to set straight. And so that's kind of the context, and I think certainly uh, a feeling of doubt or insecurity in some broader sense is something that all of us geeks can relate to. Um, but this stands out to me because of how it speaks to the issues of identity and value and significance. And that's something that we are sorting out, beginning to sort through in junior high and high school. But really, I think there's a, there's a sense in which, especially in Western, maybe specifically American culture, we really have trouble growing up out of that stage. Um, certainly we see that outside of, of uh, the church, but we see it a lot in the church too, that we're still working through issues of identity and self-confidence. We're just not settled. We're still kind of in the uh, mode that high school puts us in of like, who are the cool kids? Am I one of the cool kids? Am I in the in crowd? Am I kind of like one of the weirdos and stuff like that? And, uh, uh, and so the rest of our lives, we can still end up pursuing self-image and by playing all the games of the world in terms of pursuing career success or some kind of social status in our, in our communities and stuff. Um, and uh, so I, I find that, you know, this is all, all the more relevant to us as, as geeks that are maybe no longer living at home. Um, but anyway, let me see here. One thing I noticed first about this passage is how he emphasizes this idea of being children of God. Now, I think for many years, uh, in large part because I grew up in a Christian home, I was familiar with this idea that as believers, we are adopted children of God. But I, I, I don't think I really reflected on it deeply until maybe the last, somewhere in the last five to ten years um, for the significance it would have for me uh, personally. Um, when I think about God's love, very often it's 
couched in terms of love for the world, this very broad love for humanity, for people. Um, and although we know logically, as we look at scripture, that God is capable of loving and does love each person individually and very specifically, very often the language as it's translated in English anyway, um, it's probably the same uh, in Hebrew and Greek, I don't know for sure, but uh, the language is, is, is talking about a broad people. And there's truth to that. I mean, we don't want to become overly individualistic because much of what God is doing is for a people, creating a people for himself, of which we are each uh, a part as, as believers in Jesus. And yet, uh, I still kind of wanted a stronger sense um, of God's individualized love for me. And at some point when I became a dad, even though we only have two kids, I began to understand what I had heard from other parents who had many more kids uh, that I'd heard over the years where they would say, yeah, even though we have like six, seven kids, whatever, um, I love each of them individually. That it's, it's, not, it, it's not less personal. My, my relationship with, with each of them is not less personal. It's just unique given who they are and what my particular interactions with them are like. And so that idea really helped solidify in my mind kind of a, a parallel that I could hold on to to help me better visualize and accept the, uh, the specific love that God has for me as a child of God. So suddenly these verses about being a child of God were a lot more relevant. They weren't just flowery language as in good that go in one ear and out the other as they had been for most of my life. Suddenly I was like, oh, these are precious verses to me. So that's one reason why this really stands out to me that, you know, to know that I'm not lost in the crowd, that, that the things that are important to me that I know is like, well, God it has every right to just not be concerned about this thing going on in my life that I'm concerned about because there's, he's got much bigger fish to fry. Not that he's distracted or busy, but that this idea in my head that like he wouldn't be that concerned because he has a much bigger picture that he's working with. And yes, he does have that bigger picture, but that doesn't mean he's any less invested in me and concerned for me and caring for me, even as I'm struggling with feelings that if I had the right perspective, I wouldn't be struggling with, you know. Um, so anyway, there's there's that component to this passage, um, but there's also this this value and significance component of being the children of the God of all reality. And it's interesting to me how this is emphasized um, two, arguably three times. He says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. Well, I guess four, if you count that, a reference to him being our Father. That we should be called the children of God. And so we are. So it's kind of, it's, he kind of states in a different way, just affirms, that is the truth. Uh, the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. So that's, that's arguably four times that in some way, the idea of being God's children uh, is emphasized. And I think that uh, often writers of scripture will emphasize things or repeat things because they know it's so easy for us to forget. And I don't know about you, but in just the normal rhythms of everyday life, we're not living in a world where anybody recognizes uh, that we have intrinsic value. That's just not the normal uh, worldview. Even among Christians, if we don't remember that the person that we're interacting with has immense value, then we're not going to be operating as, as though they, they do. Um, and he even acknowledges that as well in verse 2. The reason... Uh, excuse me, end of verse one. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So he mentions that the world doesn't know us kind of in passing and explains it, the reasons for it. But still, that's that's a recognition there. That's, an, that's a um, just an acknowledgement that, yeah, we live in this world where we're not going to, people are not going to think of us as valuable or special or, um, you know, worthy of, of much of anything. Um, and so if we feel that, if we feel this disconnect between like this idea of, well, I know that I'm God's child, but I don't feel that, then that shouldn't send off any alarm bells saying, well, then maybe it's not true because scripture itself acknowledges that we live in a world where we're not going to feel like that is the most obvious reality, um, uh, in our experience. So that acknowledgement, I think that we live in a world that doesn't recognize us doesn't recognize the value that we have, 
that other people don't recognize the value that they have either, you know, that that is to be expected. And I think helping to set our expectations in that way can be really valuable to our endurance. Um, and so, yeah, we forget, others forget, we all just forget what our value is. And so it's so important to, to come back to this. Um, and then also, let's see here, verse 2, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Now, the mechanics of how that works, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. I could speculate on, I'm not going to do that right now, though. Um, what I have my attention on at the moment is... This sense of, yes, we are God's children now, but there's something that's not complete. There's something more to come. Um, and so we haven't arrived, and we shouldn't expect to feel like we have arrived at this wonderfully settled, completed state. That is still to come. And so again, it helps us set, a, set our expectations. You know, I'm going to wake up plenty mornings and go to bed plenty nights where I am just not satisfied with my life, with how I feel about myself. Um, that is to be expected. And that that shouldn't alarm us. Um, and uh, yeah, so when what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And so that sense of completion is also tied to the return of Jesus and the future hope that we have in that. And so I think as even as we're setting our expectations and saying, you know what, um, this life kind of sucks and I'm not treated well with the respect um, that, that I should have as a child of God. Um, but I can look ahead and know that it, this is not going to be how things are forever. And that sort of perspective is also encouraged in Colossians 3, 2 through 4, which I'll just briefly read. It says in the ESV, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So it's alluding to this same kind of mysterious transformation that's, uh, that's going to happen to us when Christ returns. But that idea of your life being hidden with Christ in God, when I was talking to my boys last weekend, I compared it to the classic um, superhero concept of secret identities. And how Clark Kent, especially in the uh, older stories of Clark Kent, older movies, older comics, where his uh, meekness, his timidness, his nerdiness as Clark Kent was played up more. I always wish that they would come back to that. They, they haven't really as much as I would like in a long, long time. But you, I think we can also still, still see it very strongly with Peter Parker. That um, Peter has this, uh, this life that is not going well most of the time. Things are not working out for him as Peter Parker. When he puts on the suit and he goes and does Spider-Man stuff, well, he still runs into pl plenty of problems. But at least he's seen completely differently, and there's a number of people that respect him and treat him differently because he's Spider-Man. Same thing with Superman. People overlook Clark Kent. Um, they uh, disregard him. They devalue him. They uh, just kind of use and abuse him. But Superman is revered for his character and for who he is and what he does, you know. And I think that there's a real sense in which we, as believers, can relate to that. There's a parallel there, that who we truly are, that people don't recognize, is currently hidden. Um, we are living life as the bumbling day-to-day -day civilian that's, you know, down on their luck and not treated well. But who we truly are inside that no one sees is actually amazing and uh, worthy of respect. Um, so anyway, yeah, those, those two passages, I mean, I just briefly touched on Colossians 3, 2 through 4, but, uh, but especially uh, 1 John chapter 3, 1 through 2, uh, I just see as valuable passages as we are trying to, well, as we're doing in our Proverbs series, trying to have a better, more realistic perspective on life, to set our expectations properly. But also we see in these words, which we don't get much of in Proverbs, um, a reason to hope, a reason to endure right now, because who we truly are and what we will truly become is an amazing thing that we can look forward to because of Jesus. 
If you would like some help finding a good church in your area, I would love to help you do that if I can. Online resources and communities are good supplements, but by their very nature, they can't speak to your particular situation like relationships in a local church can. The context for almost everything in the New Testament assumes that we are serving and building purposeful relationships in a local church. So uh, whether you're in a church that lacks Bible-based intentionality or maybe not attending any church at all right now, uh, uh, if I can help you get connected to an authentic, compassionate, Bible-oriented church, I would love to do that. Email me, please, P-A-E-T-E-R at spiritblade.com, and uh, we can try to look at some websites of churches in your area together.